Hi everyone. Welcome to Reason with Science. I'm your host Jitendra. This episode is with Michael Levin and Nick Lane. Mike is a professor in the biology department at Tufts University, where he studies the role of bioelectric signals in regulating development and regeneration in animals. Nick is a professor of evolutionary biochemistry at University College London. His work is focused on the fundamental processes that underlie the origin and evolution of life. In this conversation, we talk about major transitions and key innovations in biology, information in biological systems, bioelectricity, emergence of eukaryotes, and importance of bioelectric signals to create artificial life. Enjoy the conversation, share and subscribe to support the podcast. Thank you for listening. Hi Mike and hi Nick. Welcome back. Hi. Thank you. Hey. Thanks for yeah. having me. Yeah, so um I mean the the kind of theme that I had in my mind is is kind of like talk, talk about emergence of life. But uh, of course I don't want to ask you to define life because I know <laughs> your response. Uh, both of you have been standing on on this kind of response that life is a continuum. So uh we we can kind of uh, take it from there. but um when we think of emergence of life there is certainly a, a kind of transition we can think of it's a transition of chemistry to biology and and both of the frameworks that you guys are studying i mean origin of life or developmental biology both of them they they are a uh, kind of this example of uh, this transition so let's take that big picture view uh, what are um, like how do you look at this uh, continuum how we can uh, think of that continuum uh, depend depending upon a bacteria or uh, a mold or a planaria uh, you know living in a pond so let's start with nick okay uh, i mean you say a transition from chemistry to life and i think both mike and i would probably emphasize electrochemistry or at least um is 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 borderline physics really in terms of what we're talking about um and and so the key i suppose in my mind is is not a single moment where you 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 know you switch from one thing into another one even when you introduce information there isn't a single moment um but there's a there's a process uh, and, and that process is partly over time and it's partly structured um and the thing that i like most i think about the the kind of environments i talk about for the origin of life which are mostly hydrothermal systems but the the nice thing about those systems is really that they have a structure which is cell like and they can template cells that in effect can grow within them uh, and and when i say cell like the key attribute in my own mind to cells is the charge on the membrane um it's really that that defines the cell from its environment uh, and which coordinates everything that's happening inside the cell and so at the origin of life you have a, a effectively a structure with charges on barriers that are cell like structures uh and it gives you this as a setup from the very beginning and then there's you know there's lots of interesting questions that we haven't really answered yet but but you know how how does charge organize things it certainly does but you know to what extent and in what ways mike yeah um i i think uh, what i'd like to do is uh take i mean i i agree with everything nick just said but i <clears throat> i i'll maybe take one step back and kind of talk about um this question of uh physics versus chemistry versus biology mm. um i i've i've uh, come more and more to the view that what we're really talking about in almost all of these problems has to be cashed out with respect to an observer So to me the question of whether something is physics or is it chemistry or is it biology or is it psychology or is it what you know what is it going to yeah. be right is it should be specified relative to an observer who chooses a particular lens so one experience that i often have is that um i'll describe some amazing thing that the biology biological systems do and people say oh wow this is super cool and then if if i happen to have the mechanism for it i will say here's here's the mechanism and then people mm-hmm. say wow oh, well well that's just physics well well that's not <laughs> well that's not memory that's i can see how that works that's not memory that's just physics and so there's this amazing uh a, a kind of moving of the goalposts that basically all of the interesting stuff right the, you know cognition intelligence um uh, uh, uh memory decision making problem solving meaning all of these things the minute you you show some sort of a mechanism underneath 
then some people say, wow, that's not, that wasn't it at all. I, what I really mean is this other thing. This is just, you hmm. know, this is just physics, right? So what I prefer is this idea that you have a set of different tools that you can bring to bear and you can take anything and look at it and say, well, that's physics. And well, guess what you'll see? You'll see physics. You bring, mm-hmm. if you bring your voltmeter, right? If you bring your, your, your ruler and your weigh scale and, you know, stuff like that, guess what you'll see? You'll see physics. And if you bring other kinds of tools that are um, uh, conceptual tools that are uh, better suited to recognize agency. So maybe you bring something that recognizes virtual governors or it recognizes uh, a decision making or something. Well, then maybe you'll find that and maybe you won't. So it's an empirical process, right? So so that's kind of my my view on this. I think I think anything can be seen as just physics and many things mm. can also be seen as something much more and and you know looked at at a higher level. Yeah. I mean actually the origin of life is is kind of a an exemplar of exactly that because there are people who come from completely different disciplines uh, in terms of training. So coming as a physicist or as a chemist or as a geologist or or as a cosmologist or a biologist and so on. And you realize when you try to talk to people with a very different background that, um, that you don't share the same language. And however much you try to be a scientist, uh, you find that you're conditioned and you have some some blinkers on which make you see the problem with that toolkit. And half of the problem that I have in working on the origin of life is to try and dismantle uh, my own toolkit and replace it with, well, just try to be a scientist, just try to bring all these things together because it is a question in all of those disciplines. Uh, and, and and that's just the beginning of life. And once we get into life, it just becomes more sophisticated and more of a problem. It's just that you can see it really clearly at the origin of life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think the. I mean, of course, it's it can also be the psychology itself that we like to categorize stuff. You know, it's it's mm. the, this concept of categorical thinking itself. Um, but let's not go into the psychology right now. Um, but yeah. maybe we can kind of replace the emergence of life, um, like kind of idea to emergence of complexity, because certainly integration does happen. Uh, Stealing a word from Nick Lane's uh, when we were chatting last time, you use this word of integration rather than uh, reductionist approach. Um, So when we think of this integration of some sort of simpler molecules, uh, then uh, we are are kind of talking about this uh, biological system. So Let's probably kind of talk about the properties of biological systems. So what can be uh, those, you know, or what are the uh, key innovations which enable, uh, uh, you know, life forms? Do you Mike? Want to Mike? Sorry, did you say Mike? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, uh, I'll, okay, I'll pick, I'll pick just one thing, uh, which is, uh, which is what, what Nick already mentioned, which is resting potential. And the thing that w- one, one interesting thing about resting potential is that, uh, in many ways, it's a coarse grained sort of higher level entity because it's dis- it's different. If, if, if you are a mechanism that keys off of resting potential, it is not the same as keying off of potassium concentration or sodium concentration or chloride concentration right it's this it's this slightly higher level thing and so so if if you're in in fact it's one of these things like many other things in 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 cognitive science if if you want to be a micro reductionist you might say well there's no such thing you might say right if you're sort of a laplacian the demon kind of uh, creature right you might say there's no resting potential what there is is just, there's some sodiums and there's some potassiums and you know those are like those are your low level uh kind of um uh, bedrock, but but what's cool about resting potential is well, one of many things is that it's one of the first steps up that I think life does in generalizing, coarse graining, getting good at noticing large scale um, uh, control elements that are not reducible down to uh, individual details, right? And while all of these, of course, the resting potential is 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 of course a consequence of the various ions you have, the fact that you can have the same resting potential from different concentration of ions, right? As long as mm. you change them out correctly, right? So, so, so you can you can vary the low level details and still get the same resting potential. And conversely, you can get uh, different resting potentials with exactly the same uh, genetics, for example, with the same ion channels because they could be open or closed. So you get this interesting bow tie kind of architecture where there's this like functional node in the middle where things sort of feed into it, and then multiple multiplicities um, come out of it. But it itself is the super interesting node from the perspective of information theory, control, and all of that. 
So mm. Nick, before you respond to that, uh, I will add another point here. So I mean, because the mainstream view is that the the the, the key innovation is the genome, right? So let's yeah. let's let's kind of uh, get it out of the way already and kind of already mention it. Why um, you know the the information is not genome itself, uh, but why we are talking <laughs> about the resting potential. I, I mean, I don't think that either of us would want to be pigeonholed as kind of anti-genome. It's just that it's not the genome is not the only thing that's going on. Um, and as soon as you know, as soon as Mike is talking about um, generating effectively a single parameter, which is the resting potential, which could be multiple different ions, which is going to require multiple different pumps in the membrane, but they're pumping against a pressure which is pushing back against them. So that so there is there is a unified entity which is which is the resting potential which which is kind of integrating everything um and the trouble i think with only seeing life as the genome is is it, it tends to insist that the genome invents cells as well and invents structure and space and charge and all of these other things and it really it doesn't it it it, it it's capable of generating them but it never really makes some membrane membranes come from other membranes the spatial setting of the cell is it, you know it comes from other cells and then people say well there's a chicken and egg problem at the origin of life where does the cell come from well you know if you've got a cell shaped hole and cells you know think you know it's not difficult actually to make a bilayer membrane surrounding an aqueous space that's a cell like structure it's not a difficult thing to do um but as soon as you've got that then information has some meaning, and genes begin to have some meaning. Um, and, but but they're still they need they need there's got to be some higher level of integration for just to use the word meaning. Otherwise, everything's you know a bit, uh, and they don't relate to each other. So I think that is why charge is so important. One way that I like to think of it is if you have. I mean, I, I like to think of individual cells in part because I work on them and in part because they're just easier for me to grasp. The whole central nervous system is just too big and complicated for me to really comprehend. But if you think about a single cell and you think about the um, the amount of biochemistry that's going on inside it, there's, you know, there's a billion reactions a second going on um, in a bacterial cell. And, and a lot of them are repeat things. So you could imagine there may be 10,000 Krebs cycles all spinning at the same time, um, and they're all plugged into the membrane. And so the rate at which they spin and the direction in which they spin uh, is going to depend on this larger factor, which is the, the membrane potential of the bacterium. Um, so you know, to pump against that potential requires a certain force. And that force is coming from the environment that you're in. Do you have the substrate to power the pumping or did you run out or was there any oxygen there or whatever? So so it's immediately giving you a, a kind of a, a feed in of what the environment is that you're in and then a feedback, which is, uh, you know, <laughs> which is integrating all these all these 10,000 different cycles going around every second. Um, how do they all know what the other one is doing? How do you integrate all of that into the behavior of a cell, which is capable of kind of coordinating all of this? So you need that higher level property, um, and 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 I I think that's where it's where it's coming from. So I think the hardware software analogy uh, goes well here. Can we can we use that analogy to um, explain this integration? What do you think, Mike? Yeah, I think I think that's I think that's that's a very good lens on all of these things because uh, we know that when we look at the genome, what do we see? We we don't see any of the large scale kinds of things that you might be interested in. How many eyes? What kind of legs? Does it have legs? You don't see any of that. What you see is is protein sequences. So the micro level hardware that every cell gets to have. Now. As, as Nick points out, the, the, the context and, and, the, and the rest of the cell is critical. Otherwise, this stuff means nothing. And then all of the actual large-scale features, the behavior, is then this, the result of the physiology, the, literally the software. So, so you know, uh, in, in a kind of a very uh, uh, simplistic analogy, you, you're looking at a, at a typical computer. Sure, it's important uh, that you have the right silicon and copper and, and all of that. Yes, you need all that stuff. But after that, all the all the action is in the software. All the actions in the algorithm. It's in the electrical physiology of what this thing does. 
And I think I think it's no accident that 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 our um, uh, our our information technology and and the way our brains work and you know non neural bioelectricity all of them use the, these electrical networks. They're just a really powerful tool for processing information, and and that's what the uh, again no as as Nick said not to give not not to take anything away. The the you need certain hardware, so you need the genome to to give you certain things. But uh, if the, you don't get the membrane from the genome. You don't get the cytoskeleton uh, structure. You get the proteins, but you don't get the structure that that it templates on the previous cytoskeleton. All of these physiological things are over and above the genetic hardware. <clears throat> yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it it's quite interesting. The only um, or or because I I a lot I I think about um, a lot of work that we are doing in evolutionary biology, for example, where we just mm -hmm. compare genomes and try to understand. Um, the the extinct species, etc. So then, how much we can rely on on that kind of information? I mean, of uh, of course, we are we are getting to know more about the hardware. Then, uh, what about the software? Are there ways to do it or uh, go there? I mean, you mentioned extinct species, but uh, this is one of the most important things about paleontology. Is the only way you know what a dinosaur looked like is from finding a fossil of it. Um, you know, most of the variety of life over the last, you know, five, 600 million years or so of animals alone, um, the only way we know what they look like, I mean, in principle, we could do it from the genome in the end, but in practice, we're a long way from being able to do that now. Um, and, and I don't know if we could ever do it um, in principle if we didn't have examples of the kind of thing to compare it with. So I think we're, you know, we're, we're, we're quite shockingly ignorant about how this system works from a genome level <laughs> at the moment. And it's, um, I think part of it is we're, we're exactly what Mike was saying. We're forgetting the software. We're looking at the hardware only, and we're not thinking about how is this working as a, as a unified system, as an organism with physiology, and, and what makes that physiology operate at a higher level to just the hardware that generates it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this, this business of predicting, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I, one of the things that I s is show in, in some of my talks is mm, here's a, here's a baby axolotl. It's a salamander and mm -hmm. they have little legs, you know, the babies have legs and here's yeah. a tadpole of a frog, Xenopus. They don't have legs. And so in our lab, we make a frog a lot. Yeah. 50% axolotl, 50% <laughs> frog. Right. So now you get a frog a lot. Right. So now, so now I ask a simple question. You have the genome of the axolotl fully sequenced. You've got the genome of the frog fully sequenced. Is the frog a going to have legs or not? We have absolutely no idea. There's no way to tell. We have no way to tell. And and if and and if that's not bad enough, like Nick was saying, if you don't actually have something to compare a genome to, we don't know what the frog or the axolotl would look like either. You, we we have no ability right now to look at a genome and say, ah, yes, this thing has uh, six legs and and whatever. No, you have no, no no ability to do that other other than comparing it to other ones that you've had. So. Uh, and not to mention all of the scenarios in which, and we, we've shown many and other people have shown many scenarios in which the genetic information uh, literally misleads you because if there's interventions in the, at the physiology level, that, that tends to win. And so we have many examples where there's uh, oncogenic mutations, but no cancer. Mm. There are developmental mm. mutations, but there's no there's no defect because we've intervened at the physiological level. Or we 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 have um, worms that have the heads belonging to another species of flatworm that's 150 million years distant, and you, you sequence that genome, you will not get the right answer about what the head of that animal looks like. You just won't get the right answer. So, you know, but both are important, but uh, but it's not all about the genome for sure. Hmm. Yeah, so let's kind of uh, talk a little little bit more about the software. So um, is it only about bioelectricity? Maybe first you can introduce a little bit uh, about like what is bioelectricity and how uh, we go about it. Mike, Mike do you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, okay. So, so uh, where where I take up uh, so 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 to answer the second part is it's it's I don't think it's only bioelectricity because there are some interesting. Uh, for example, recently uh, we and other and 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 um, Richard Watson, some other people before that, found for example that very simple uh, things like gene regulatory networks or, or pathways. It could be a protein pathway. They actually have a kind of plasticity where they can do uh, many different kinds of learning. So you can do they can do um, uh, habituation, anticipation, associative learning, just in the dynamical systems uh, sense without any rewiring. So 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 even 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 chemical pathways can do some of this, right? So so, so some of this cognitive stuff goes all the, all the way down. But what I really like about bioelectricity 
uh, and and where I where I take it up is is uh, sort of after I sort of assume the cell is there and everything is there. So 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 Nick covers the the earlier stuff. I kind of just assume it's all it's all there. And after that, um, what we see is is this remarkable thing that uh, because cells have the ability to generate a resting potential using ion channels and pumps in the membrane. And they have these little um, uh, electrical synapses known as gap junctions, which allow them to share their state with their neighbors. Mm -hmm. And both, both the channels and the gap junctions can themselves be voltage sensitive. So now what you have is a, is a voltage gated ion conductance, which is basically a transistor that gives you a kind of historicity. It gives you feedback loops, memory right there, right, 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 uh, you know, right there. And when you connect, when these cells connect with each other um, uh, into electrical networks, you get some of the same phenomena we see in the brain, just on a slower time scale. So these are not millisecond; these are hours, you know, on the scale of hours. But there's all kinds of amazing information processing that these networks can do that uh, allow them to pursue larger goals. So, 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 so I love, I love the um, the evolutionary. Um, uh, electrochemistry and the metabolics, because I think these are the very first kinds of spaces in which living systems solve problems, right? Metabolic space, bioelectric space like that. But after that, they can, when they join into these electrical networks, now they can solve problems in anatomical morphous space. They can do things like uh, remember what the correct shape is, figure out, do we have the correct shape? What needs to be done? All of that. And then later on, you get a brain and now you can, you can operate in three-dimensional behavioral space and linguistic space, who knows what else. So um, that's, you know, that's my story of electricity is, is this like uh, transistor like ability of cells to join into networks and, and, and compute after that. And mm. can we reduce it to, to molecular level? Um, yes, I think we can, but I don't know that we have the ability to do it yet. Um, I mean, I, 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 I tend to think in terms of mitochondria and um how they're going to communicate for example I just take a, a, a really simple thing there's two ways of seeing this apoptosis controlled cell death um, the mitochondria are involved in that and, and loss of membrane potential is 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 part of what's happening also whether mitochondria get targeted to be broken down or not um no one's ever quite got what's happening um and it's partly because the mitochondria have two membranes and the the outer membrane um, is is not electrically charged, or at least not very much, if it is at all. Uh, whereas the inner membrane has got a pretty high potential on it. Um, but the, the proteins that are targeting the mitochondria without a membrane potential are targeting the outer membrane. And there are protein complexes that join the two up, and it's possible that it can work that way. Um, but it's also possible that there's electrical signaling across those distances. And I think it's likely that there is. But then the question becomes, well, if it's simply an electrostatic potential, um, then it falls off very quickly because it it, uh, it it decays with the square root of the distance. Um, so, so it's it's not going to it's not going to signal very far. Whereas electromagnetic fields potentially could signal much further, but that requires a very specific morphology to be able to work at all. And there's a, there's an interesting and difficult question about well, just what could they do? How can they interact with the hardware? And there are ways that they can, undoubtedly. But is it strong enough? Can we measure it? Do we have the facilities to 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 get at all these things? So I, I think it does work at the molecular level, um, and I, I think over very short distances. So, for example, with the with the ATP synthase, there's a, a beautiful work from Wayne Frash recently showing, I, I don't know, the, the, the C ring, which is the, it's, it's basically this is a rotating motor protein that sits in the inner <laughs> membrane of the mitochondria. And, and there's, there's in, in our cells, there's eight subunits in this ring and a proton binds on and it just kind of moves around. So it needs each proton that binds on, it needs to move. For, for eight subunits to turn in a complete circle, that would be about 37 degrees or something like that. So the binding of the prote proton moves the whole ring around by about 37 degrees. Um, and how does it do that? Nobody has ever quite figured it out, but it's been known for decades that the actual electrical potential on the membrane does quite a lot of that work. Uh, and he's shown quite recently 
um, that actually it, 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 it with just the proton it moves about 11 degrees and with the uh, with, with with the uh, electrical potential as well that takes it another 25 degrees or, or something of that order uh, of, of rotation so it's the this local electrostatic charge which is which is driving that so over short distances it's really beautifully demonstrated that you you need the charge on the membrane for this to work but over longer distances, um, if you're dealing with perhaps a few micrometers or something, then I would be surprised if electrostatic charges alone were, were doing that. They may be. They certainly are at the plasma membrane in terms of connections between cells and, and having the same charge across effectively wider expanses. But the mitochondria are interesting in that sense as well, in that the Christi are closed very often and separate from each other. Mm. Um, and, mm -hmm. and so you can have different different membrane potentials in different Christi in the same mitochondria. You can have individual mitochondria, or you can have a a, a, a network that all join together. Uh, there's so much subtlety in all of this, um, and, and to underpin all of that, nobody has ever successfully measured the membrane potential of mitochondria accurately. And the, the reason for that is if you simply use a microelectrode and you, in, you insert it into the matrix of the mitochondria, into the middle of the mitochondria, what you'll measure, and this has worked going back decades from, from a guy called Tedeschi, but other people have come to the same conclusion, you get about 10 or 20 millivolts. It's not much, um, somewhat less than the plasma membrane. All of the calculations, all of the change in pH, all the chemiosmotic hypothesis is saying it should be 150 to 200 millivolts. So where's that difference coming from? It's partly that we're, we're using voltage sensitive dyes to accumulate, and it's very difficult to calibrate them. Uh, and it's partly that we now know the structure of the mitochondria is different. They are closed Christie. So what you're measuring with the microelectrode is the difference between the matrix space and the cytosol. And what we really want to measure is the difference between the matrix space and the Christie space. <clears throat> um, and, and, and no one's really ever managed to get anything into that Christie space, which is capable of reporting back on the charge there. So it's, it's definitely working at the, at the molecular level for sure. It depends a lot on the actual structure, which only in the last few years with super resolution microscopy and cryo tomography and things like that, are we able to, to, to really get a, a handle on exactly what is the structure of mitochondria and exactly how do these spaces relate to each other and so on. Um, and, and, and no one's ever measured it properly. So it's, it's kind of glaring ignorance again at the heart of all of this. But until we can measure these things accurately, and understand how they change over short periods of time, which may be seconds or minutes, uh, I would think, um, then you know there's, there's got to be a certain amount of hand waving about it. But but to think that it's not the right place to look is, I think, to miss the most important things in science now. Um, no, just, you, just and this is totally not my area, so maybe this is a dumb idea. But uh, any chance that one could make a synthetic one that was big enough where? It, would that change everything if you sort of made one that was already, um, you know, sort of basically synthetically try to make that, uh, that uh, you know, a, a big mitochondria around some sort of um, uh, uh, engineered electrodes that were already where you needed them to be and sort of assemble the thing around them? Any chance somebody could build something like that? Or would um, that be totally it would be, Well, it would be a fun thing to try and do. I think it would be difficult because the... I think what you tend to build around it would be something in the structure of a sphere or <laughs> something along those lines. Um, yeah. And what we're actually dealing with, I mean, there are, again, there are stunning structures to the Christie membranes. We tend to just see them as a wavy line in the textbook, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but but they're, they're stunningly structured. But sometimes you get amazing kind of arrays of triangular shapes and things. You, you see some, uh, you know, they're doing bioenergetics, but in what world are they doing that? They're definitely, there's nothing in known bioenergetics that says what they, why they have triangular shaped Christie. We just have no idea. Yeah. Hmm. So for you, um, metabolism is like central to bioelectricity, is it? I think the two are connected and are integrated that way. I think they have been from the very beginning um, because to my mind, you know, for, for any form of selection to work, you have to have growth. You have to have cells which are duplicating themselves. 
Um, and then you have some form of selection. Either they do it slowly or they do it quickly or they survive longer or they, you know, but you have different outcomes. As soon as you've got cells, you don't have to have genes in those cells. You just have to have cells which are capable of doubling. And if you're starting as life does on Earth with CO2, um, then the point of having the electrical membrane potential is in effect to get CO2 to react with hydrogen. They, they don't, they're not particularly reactive. They don't particularly want to react together. And cells today... Um, effectively use the charge on the membrane to 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 force them to react, um, and, and those charges make sense at the origin of the li uh, origin of life because what you have, as, as uh, Peter Mitchell actually said in in, in 1957, um, the inside and the outside of a cell, if you like, are two uh, equivalent phases separated and linked by the membrane that, that's uh, between them. Um, and those phases are not the same in terms of their ionic composition or anything else. They cannot be. One is one is the living cell, and the other one is the outside world, uh, and and that necessarily generates charges on those membranes, and 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 those charges necessarily organize things. So it you know however much you 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 know it's just there. You cannot avoid it. You will have a charge on a membrane, and that charge on the membrane does something useful, even in a purely prebiotic world, which is to say it will make carbon dioxide react with hydrogen to make organic molecules inside this cell-like thing, which has now got more organic molecules inside, which would include more membrane molecules and everything else. And so it, it can grow. So the whole thing from the very beginning, way before we had genes, is driven by charge and structure. Mm. Yeah, Richard, um, the late Richard Borgens had, had this, uh, made this interesting point where he said that as as soon as so super early on, as soon as you have a membrane that segregates some some goodies inside the organism versus outside, you can you're likely to have a charge imbalance. And then if you get injured, so let's say the membrane gets gets perforated, you immediately get a free vector to the side of the damage because of the short circuit of the electric field. You get mm -hmm. and and that's and you get that for free. That's a free gift from physics. You don't need a genome. Yes. You don't need a, right. You don't need pathways. You don't need a, you don't need any of that. Immediately, you know where the damage was. So if you have some sort of electrosensitive um, uh, subunit, as as occurs in wound healing and whatnot, uh, it, it it just the physics tells you what the what, what where where to go to, to to plug up the damage and so on. So I, I'm I'm guessing there are many of these things that are just you know, so these 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 free gifts that we get from from chemistry and physics, and and then the evolution uh, exploits those in different ways. Mm. So since you already mentioned evolution, let's talk about it. So how uh, the, these kind of systems will evolve, mm. Nick? Um, I, I mean, I I think as as I say, the for, for bacterial cells, for single cells, the membrane is is what divides them from the outside world and there's no way you know how does it know what's happening outside um well things impinge on you know on 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 the membrane and cross that membrane and this the, the cell with its biochemistry has to figure out what does that mean and what am i going to do should I swim that way or should I swim this way? Or you know, how, how am I going to behave in response to this? So there's never, you know, it doesn't know that there's an oil slick over there or whatever it may be, it, but it's picked up something and it needs to make a decision as a cell what it's going to do next. So I, I quite like the ideas from um, from um, Carl Friston uh, and, uh, on this, who talks about a, a Markov blanket in the cell mm -hmm. membrane as being a Markov blanket. And effectively, it's translating between the language of the outside world and the language of biochemistry inside. And that language of biochemistry inside is trying to find this low energy state, in effect, which is its homeostatic preferred place to be. I, I, I'm not sure I, I convey very well what he has to say on this, but the way I interpret it or understand it is, well, if you're in a bad environment, then you know your proteins start to unravel and denature, and 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 it's uh, that's actually a higher energy state and not a place you want to be. And if you move over there and your proteins start renaturing again, then that's a better place to be. Um, but you you still need to integrate all of you know you've taken a statistical sampling of the outside world you've got a correlation that says this happened therefore do that but you take multiple samples of this through multiple receptors and they're conflicting some of them say go over there some of them say go over there 
So how do you integrate all that information and make a decision about what to do? Um, and that's where the plasma, the, the cell membrane, the plasma membrane, if you like, begins to integrate all that information. If you're you know, if, if the problem is that you're poisoned and your substrates don't work, then your membrane potential is going to fall. If your membrane potential falls, then you move over there sharpish. Um, so, you know, it, it provides you with information on your state in the world as a single entity. Um, and I like to think of that as the simplest possible imaginable form of the stream of consciousness, which is to say is integrating real-time information about your state in relation to the world in terms of am I good or am I not good? <laughs> really, that's the simplest, simplest thing. Do I do I go there? Do I get, do I stay here? What you know, it's 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 that seems to me to be a fundamental decision for a living cell to make, which is based entirely on its need to survive in the world and which is integrated by the membrane and in effect by electrical charge on the membrane as you integrating that information yeah 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 that's that's a really good point um chris fields uh talks about this kind of thing in bacteria as a um as an early form of metacognition because if you imagine you're a bacterial cell in some sort of gradient uh yeah you can measure the actual molecule that you're interested in but for example, it might be poisonous. It might there might be a poisonous version of it. And so, what you might also want to have, and some bacteria have this, is a way of uh, measuring indirectly instead of tracking the thing you really want to track. What they track is your own metabolism. So, so right. So, mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a kind of a self monitoring loop. Basically, a, yeah. a, a simple example of metacognition where you're, you where where you say, okay, I'm not going to worry about the details of of what it is I'm trying to metabolize. Let's just how are we doing? Are we like you know? Yeah. And yeah. and and that gives you there's some trade offs there, but it gives you this this incredible uh, power of coarse graining over all kinds of details to have a large scale variable to deal with, right? And 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 yeah. metabolic state and and membrane potential is a fantastic. Uh, example of that, and I think getting back to to the evolution question, one th one sort of hypothesis I would I will put out there is that the fact that we have these metabolic needs, and the fact that you don't have all the time in the world to process every possible uh, scenario because you're going to be fall apart and be eaten, is really I think a key driver of intelligence for the following reason: if you are a creature that does not have these constraints it doesn't have metabolic needs for example like a modern ai which is plugged into the wall it has all the energy it needs it never has to worry about getting getting any energy if you're a biologically uh, a biological um, agent that arose in evolution under these constraints that you you are constantly under this metabolic pressure one of the things you cannot afford to do is to be a uh, micro uh, reductionist meaning that i'm mm -hmm. going to track all the micro states in my environment you do not have time to, to, to try to be a Laplacian demon. You, there's just no time for that. Yes. Instead, there's great pressure to become really good at coarse graining the world into chunks that you can, you can large scale um, uh, affordances, observables, uh, control knobs, and, and pay attention to those and, and completely uh, sort of abstract what's underneath. So that pressure to, uh, to 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 cut up the the all the details into higher level things that you're going to represent like my metabolism my resting potential right mm. these higher level things means that all of the um uh the the ability to generalize the ability to uh, abstract from from uh, uh individual instances to general rules and general observations and even dare dare I say for for advanced organisms like us the ability to tell stories about agents doing things, in other words, mm -hmm. to have an agential view on the world, in yep. other words, yep. in right in, in in modern humans to have a view of free will as in I am a thing that does things and there's a there's a there's a tiger and tigers, are, you know, are agents that do things and so on. All of that has, I think, uh, its origin all the way at the beginning. The first agential models were made by uh, by microbes. Who had to mm. adopt that stance? They had to adopt an agential stance in order to survive in real metabolic, um, uh, under metabolic constraints. And I think what evolution did after that was scale it up to creatures that can then verbalize it, like us who yeah, can say, yeah, "Well, yeah. I've got, you know, I've got free will and this and that." But but all of this goes all the way back to the beginning to the mm. necessity to make models of large scale variables doing things, being important control knobs. If my mm. voltage is off, if my metabolism is off. I need to change my voltage. I'm not talking about this sodium ion versus that sodium ion. I'm talking about getting my voltage fixed up. And that's, you know, that I think is a driver of, of a ratchet for, for intelligence.
Mm. I mean, a couple of things. Um, one one thing about voltage and, and bacteria. There's, um, there's a guy called Ken Nielsen who, for years, has been culturing bacteria on, on electrodes. Um, mm. And the the thing is, that it, it's lots of bacteria is it's always you know it's proved impossible to culture them. Uh, in a pure culture, which is to say, just those bacteria and nothing else, and the reason is basically that they, you know, they dump their electrons onto their neighbour, which is a back, you know, another bacterial cell of a different species, let's say, which wants those electrons, um, and so it's a it's a syntrophy. They're, they're effectively living alongside each other, but the way to kind of escape from that is you you give them an electrode and you set that member the, the 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 potential the electrical potential of the electrode. So let's say minus 300 millivolts or something like that. And they, you know, they either dump their electrons onto that or they take their electrons from that. Um, but then they'll, they'll grow on that surface at that, at, at that voltage. Um, and if you switch the voltage to, say, minus 304 <laughs> millivolts, you get a different bacterial population growing there, and you change it by another three or four millivolts, wow. and you get a different, and, and you can you wow. effectively grow all of these pure cultures of bacteria by by just shifting the voltage by just a few millivolts. It's extra, it's exquisitely sensitive, um, the, the way that they. So again, it's it's how all this works at the level of cells. I don't really know, but the voltage in your mm. environment and the way in which you're, you know, where you're offloading your electrons and where you're gaining your electrons from is, it, it's, it's, you know, it's fundamental to how cells grow. But coming back to evolution again, um, bacteria are using their, their, their membrane as the interface to the world. But then we have eukaryotic cells that have internalized mitochondria um, and they start using the plasma membrane for something different, and they can be now much more interesting mm. in what you do with your plasma membrane. You don't have to be using it for energetics all the time. You can be using it for much more interesting and subtle things, including changing shape and becoming a phagocyte or uh, beating silly or whatever it may be. Um, mm. But now the this kind of simple idea that your metabolism is directly plugged into your membrane and gives you an immediate integrated feedback on your state in the world becomes much more complicated because a lot of your metabolism is happening in the mitochondria. You may have got scores of mitochondria. They may all be doing different things depending on where they are in the cell. Uh, and the cell now has a kind of a you know a, a bigger problem of how do I integrate all this extra information about how I'm doing in the environment. And it seems to me almost necessary to bring it. I mean, you you could imagine that it could all work by you know phosphorylating everything, but I find it very hard to buy. I find it much easier to imagine that either we've got networks, but but more likely we're simply signaling electrically between different mitochondria and between mitochondria and the and the cell membrane, so that the cell is integrating its state still electrically, but in a more subtle and sophisticated way. So this, you know, this is a, a big, I would say, a big challenge at the origin of the eukaryotic cell. How do you, you know, rewire yourself to work as instead of being a consortium of cells that have their own independence, but now some of them are inside. How do you kind of rewire so you act as an entity, as an individual organism at the level of the cell, with all of these things inside, all of which are metabolizing potentially in different ways. So there's a problem with integration there. And then you have the next level up, which is you become multicellular, and then you've got another problem with integration. So you're 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 you're, you're kind of taking up the you're ratcheting up the hardware required to mm. keep a mm. keep a signal which is intelligible. And by the time you got into a central nervous system, it's enormously complex, of course. I mean, that's what my next question was. Uh, so first of all, the eukaryogenesis that men that you mentioned, it's uh, again, like your argument that it happened after 2 billion years. So this is also quite exciting that, you know, or interesting that for 2 billion years, bacteria were surviving somehow. And then uh, with, with this certain transition uh, where to uh, uh, unicellular, they come yeah, together. Yeah, I mean, that's not really my argument so much as that's an observation, yeah. which is to say there are, I mean, molecular clocks, which are not to be believed very heartily for, for deep evolutionary history, but they're putting eukaryotes at one and a half to two billion years ago, that kind of time. Um, and... Uh, and, and eukaryotes all clearly share the same cell structures. They, cl they clearly share a common ancestor. 
unless convergent evolution has an astonishing power to regenerate exactly the same cell structures, but I, that's hard to buy. Um, and before that, there's plenty of evidence for bacteria going back to practically 4 billion years ago, and there's plenty of evidence for all the big um, nutrient cycles, iron cycle, carbon cycle, oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen, and so on. Um, so there's, there's plenty of evidence that there were bacteria throughout this whole time. So there is an issue with, with this apparently unique origin of eukaryotic cells. Now, it's quite possible that there were hundreds or thousands of origins of complex cells, and they all just disappeared without trace. But it's also possible that that wasn't the case and that there are structural constraints on bacteria which relate to having a charge on their membrane, which effectively say it's not, in, it's not easy to internalize all of this stuff. It's a big, big structural change. It's not easy to get inside one. And when you get inside it, you, you know, you've got your own vested interests and chances are it will go wrong. But I'm pointing to this electrical wiring issue. It's not just about integrating your biochemistry. It's also about how do I reintegrate my wiring as an individual cell, as an organism. You look at, um, I think uh, I, I think we both show the same video occasionally, Mike. Of uh, it's a ciliate with the I forget oh, yeah. which one it is, but he's got a kind of is is, is feeding yeah. with this yeah, astonishing yeah, control. Yeah. That's the one. Yes, yeah, it's yeah. astonishing. It's uh, control that it has, um, and and you think is, is is it is it really detecting concentration gradients of molecules, or is is it picking up on something electrical uh, mm. to 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 do that? How does it know that mm. there's something right there mm. and right there in in, yeah. in the space of you know seconds or less than seconds? Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, one 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 fun uh, thing that uh, there's a there's a cool paper by uh, Min Zhao and colleagues where. Uh, he shows that there are um, cells, I think maybe keratocytes or something, that crawl in a particular direction in an electric field, right? So they have very robust electrotaxis. But if you actually cut up the cell into pieces, the pieces, mm -hmm. the fragments, crawl in the opposite direction. <laughs> so, so it's a great, it's a great example of, you know, I, I think I think Richard Watson says it this way that the, you know the point of uh, holes is to get the parts to do things they wouldn't normally do, right? And this uh -huh. is like a cool example of that because the, all the parts want to go that way. The, whole, the the collective goes that way, and it's a very active electro electrosensitive process. <clears throat> yes. Fascinating. So maybe uh, let's let's talk about multicellularity because I think that's uh, so. I mean, Mike is using this coarse grain uh, uh, kind of analogy or metaphor and. Uh, uh, Nick is using uh, integration. I don't know if they are uh, different. I think it's probably both. No, I think it, it amounts to the same right? thing. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let's talk about multicellularity. That uh, and then, interestingly, I mean, of course, we nowadays we talk about biofilm, bacterial biofilms. That uh, it happens also in bacteria. Um, etc. But what is the difference between bacterial biofilms and a multicellular organism like uh, anything, any animal we can talk about, plant, fungi, etc.? Right. Uh, I mean, there's a simple yeah. answer to that, which is that they're all composed of different cells, dif different, uh, genetically very different to each other. And the point about pretty much all uh, well, all all, all mm -hmm. metazoans, um, all animals, all plants—they've all been through a single cell stage, and we're all basically clonal. So our genome is is the same. So there, uh, you know, there's there are multicellular bacteria. So filamentous cyanobacteria. Um, they have two different cell types. Um, so the nitrogen-fixing cells, the heterocysts, and 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 the photosynthetic cells. Um, so it's 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 not that it's not possible for bacteria to do that. Um, but they don't do much of it. Whereas a biofilm is, uh, you know, is, is is deep cooperation between different types of cell. But the whole of evolutionary biology and pretty much all the experiments on things like slime molds, which come <clears> together <throat> as genetically different cells and then cooperate to build a stalk, for example, for distributing spores. Um, Cheating is a is a real issue that uh, they 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 never tend to generate greater complexity than something like a a stalk, uh, because the cheats always win in the end because they're genetically distinct to each other. So I think you know mainstream evolutionary biology would just say animals are clonal, 
uh, and, and, and that, that restricts the amount of fighting that goes on between cells. And I don't see any reason to argue with that. Um, I think the reason that eukaryotic cells make animals and plants much more readily is that we have much larger genomes and we can have much, much larger genomes because we have mitochondria and much better energy generation, if you like, than, than bacteria. And that means you can switch genes on and off in different tissues and uh, or if you're switching genes on and off in different tissues, then you, you're, you're shifting not only the hardware, but also all the electrical properties of different tissues as well. So the, the more the coarse graining can be then shifted as well. Whereas if you've got different types of bacterial cell, all of which have got their own agenda, the idea of having a kind of network of cells which are generating a common, a common kind of electrical phase that they're in, uh, becomes a lot, at least a lot more problematic, I would say. Is that is that your take, Mike, or would you see it differently? So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's a su super interesting uh, topic. I'll, I'll uh, first of all about the bacteria stuff, and you you may want to um, have him on. So, um, if you haven't already, so. Um, uh, uh, Garol Soel uh, from UCSD, who studies. Uh, bacterial biofilms and the way they coordinate using bioelectricity to make sure that everybody gets fed in the population mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff so so there may be and and you know it's not my thing so you should you should talk to him but i think i think there's some very interesting cooperativity stuff going on there um what i think might be fun uh is uh, be, being a kind of a, a spoil sport that i am uh i want to po poke and, and i don't i don't uh, i don't completely I, I don't disagree with this idea that of course going through this bottleneck is important evolutionarily but i just want to bring up a few examples that kind of poke some uh poke some 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 holes into this story because i think sure. i think they're worth they're worth um getting you know getting to the bottom of um a couple of things uh the, f the first thing is that uh despite our largely uh genetic uh homogeneity inside our bodies um, cells and organs compete with each other. So, for example, during development, there is there's really a strong competition between all kinds of organs, and uh, this is and, and we have computational models of this, and, and and farmers and other you know scientists have been publishing this stuff for a really long time. There's actually a lot of competition and struggle, and 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 um, uh, the classical biologist uh, Rue um, called this. He had he had a he had a, a long a monograph called the struggle of the parts where he talks about all of the ways that the pieces of, a, of an embryo and of an organism are actually fighting each other for all kinds of mm -hmm. stuff, for, even though they have you know, similar genetics. Um, the other thing I, I want to talk about is, is how similar really the genetics are. So, so, so in humans, Doug Brash uh, tells me that uh, there are about 100,000 mutations per skin cell in normal skin. This is not cancer. This is normal skin. Mm -hmm. skin 100,000 mutations per cell. So, and, and, um, and people like... Um, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Walsh uh, at the at Harvard Medical School is is finding uh, mutations um, in the in the in the brain and in human neurons. So there's actually a, a apparently there's a there's a ton of genetic variability, and where it really reaches its uh, uh, kind of ultimate expression, I think this is one of the most interesting stories. Planaria uh, mm. are uh, mixoploid. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's a certain species. Every cell has a different number of chromosomes. The, the genome is an unbelievable mess. And yet these are the animals with the most regenerative ability, the cancer resistance, uh, immortal as far as we can tell. And it, it, it's kind of an amazing scandal that the animal with, with, with the best anatomical control, immortality mm. and regeneration is also the one with the, with the most messy genome, right? The, 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 you know, the, the every, every cell is. And so, so I, this this used to drive me completely crazy. This this uh, this idea. Well, for, first of all, why do why does nobody talk about this? We never hear about this, you know, in a standard develop in a standard biology um, a kind of curriculum. What, what they tell you is, well, the genome is what sets your anatomy. So so yeah. who would expect the relationship to be backwards? It doesn't make any sense. Um, recently, literally in the last uh, few months, I think we've got kind of a. Uh, a uh, a handle on this story, and so so I think I I think we now have an understanding of what's going on there. But um, and if 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 you want, I can I can talk about it. But yes, please. But uh, well, uh, okay. So 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 imagine this. Typically, typically the way people uh, simulate uh, evolution is you've got some sort of genotype. The genome uh, it codes for some sort of phenotype, and then then selection. So you do your mutation on the genotype, and you do your selection on the phenotype. What's often missing is that, and this goes back to the initial conversation, that physiological layer in between, 
because mm -hmm. the genotypes actually don't almost never code directly for the phenotype. What they code for sure. is properties of some sort of physiological system where the software is going to determine the phenotype. So, so we did some simulations. And we created this thing. It's 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 extremely simple. It's just uh, the genome is just a set of numbers, and 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 they're all they start off all mixed up. And the phenotype, what you select for, is making sure the numbers are all in nice order from zero to one hundred. Let's say so. This this is the developmental equivalent of having a body axis, of having a primary axis with your tail over here and your head over here, and everything mm -hmm. in the right order in between. So if you just have genotype and phenotype, of course, a standard genetic algorithm will eventually, and if you look at the fitness over time curve, it's this, you will, of course, it will sort all the numbers and you will get your, you know, you'll get your sorted embryo. That, that works fine. However, now let's do something interesting. Let's put in, and this is the work of uh, 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 Shreesha Lakshwin um, in, my, uh, in, my, in my lab, a student, an undergrad, actually. Uh, what we did was we put in a developmental uh, phase where, yeah, you've got your genome. But much like with real evolution, the cells aren't passive, dumb uh, material. They they actually have a little bit of um, uh, they have their own agenda, right? And and mm -hmm, during mm -hmm. that process, from 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 being a genome to being an or an adult that you get selected on, they have some time to do things. Cells cells are not a blank slate material, right? They they always you know they're always doing something. And so imagine if you put in just a little bit, just a tiny bit of. Um, what we call competency on the cells and the competency just works like this you look at your neighbor and if they have an if they have an identity a number that's way different from yours it it stresses you out you don't like it and so during that developmental process and this is very developmentally this is very much a fact that um that when you put two things together where their positional information is too far off that's how you get regeneration they will they will both uh, generate things in between to separate themselves and put in you know so if you put a 5 next to a 10 they will generate right. the 6 7 8 in inside right right in between them so so you give cells just a tiny ability for that for that competency just to look at their neighbors and maybe crawl around a little bit to try and reduce their stress level what happens then is that when when a when an individual comes up for evaluation of fitness and they look pretty good the numbers are kind of pretty sorted Evolution doesn't know, selection doesn't know whether it looks good because the genome was amazing or it looks good because the genome was actually so-so, but everything sort of crawled around. So what that means is that the genome now has a hard time selecting on the genotype. The, gen the genome, the, the selection cannot see mm, the mm. defects of the genotype. But, so, so it has a really hard time making any progress on improving the, the structural genome. But what it can do is, is, is put all its effort in improving in competency. So in the next generation, what you get are individuals that are slightly more competent. Now, this makes the problem worse because they're slightly more competent. It's even harder to know what their genome was like because, because they look really great. Who knows what their genome was like? And so you end up with this positive feedback loop where the minute you admit that you're dealing not with a passive material, but with cells that can, that can make some decisions locally, you immediately get into this arms race where the effort starts going into increasing that competency, not fixing the, the, the genotype. And so in the end, if you let it run all the way, now, of course, there are some other factors that can sort of dampen that, that runaway feedback loop. But if you let it run all the way, what you get are exactly planaria. You get organisms hmm. that are really good at making a good organism, no matter what the genome looks like. All the effort goes into the algorithm. Very little pressure is left to keep a clean genome. The genomes look like hell. But the organisms look amazing because all of the effort have gone into the, the mechanisms that allow them to build what they need to build, even though the hardware is all over the place. And mm -hmm. so what I think happened in planary, I think this went all the way up. And uh, and and in other organisms like like us and 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 you know and and, and other other creatures, it sort of stopped halfway. There there are other things that sort of dampen it down. So we can kind of do that, but but not as good, not as well as as planaria. And it also explains why. It's, it's such a weird thing. Uh, any other animal, any other multicellular creature, you can call a stock center and you can get a strain of abnormal mutants. So you can get flies mm -hmm, with curly mm -hmm. wings and mice with yeah. crooked tails and albinos and planaria. There is no such thing as a strain of abnormal planaria other than our two-headed form. And those are not genetic. Those are not <laughs> yes, genetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's never been a, a, a planarian mutant line. Isn't that weird? Why not? And also... For uh, now, I would say for about 30 years, maybe more, people have been trying to make transgenic planaria, and it's never worked. It's, it, it just doesn't work. Why does it not work? 
And why do we not have strains? I think because the algorithm is such that it basically ignores most of the genome, not all of it, of course, because you still need the, the competency machinery. But but yeah. but the, the, the competency is such that it can tolerate massive degrees of errors, error in the genome, and, and it expects to. That's why, because of this runaway, you know, sort of sort of runaway, runaway uh, ratchet. So, so I think, you know, I think it is true, like you said, I think, of, of course, we, we go through a bottleneck and, uh, and, and, and we do share genetically much more so than the bacteria, but I think there's a lot more play in that system, you know, I think potentially we'd, we're not actually sharing all the DNA and sure, uh, yeah. even, right, and even when we do, I think, and I think, I think Grohl would say that the bioelectrics actually is a really good way to crank up cooperativity when you don't share genetics. I'm putting words in his mouth. I don't know, but but I, I think that's what his work says to me. Yeah, I mean, one mm -hmm. well, sorry, just one quick thing on 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 the biofilms before coming around to that. Um, I mean, one 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 question that I, I had at the back of my mind is there's. Um, a lot, a lot of bacteria, for example, growing on, let's say, a, a, a rusty iron surface, and they're they're effectively putting their electrons onto the onto the iron and dissolving the rusty iron, and they're using it effectively as oxygen as an electron acceptor. And there's been a question for a long time. Okay, the 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 the, 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 the um, bacteria that are touching the surface, no problem. Uh, they just dump their electrons straight onto it. No problem. The ones which are up here somewhere mm. are not mm. actually touching that surface at all. And there were all kinds of questions about electron shuttles, quinones, external quinones that wasn't really clear quite what they were doing. The, the, the implication was that they were somehow swimming down here, putting their electrons on and then swimming back mm. again. And you think, well, how, how's a quinone going to do that? Um, and it seems much more likely that actually what they're doing is just dumping it on the next cell. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And that next cell dumps it on the one underneath. And so you end up with, yeah. yes, a, a, you know, a charge running straight through this entire colony. Yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. it becomes, in effect, altruistic, although yeah. all the individual cells were behaving selfishly and simply yeah. dumping yeah. their electrons yeah. on their nearest neighbor. Uh, and, and to some extent, this is a little bit, what you're saying mm. about a multi or planarian where they're not genetically so similar, but they're freaked out by their neighbor, which is doing something different. Um, so they are responding to this by trying to put something in the way or, 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 or presumably by fixing the charge in some way locally. So I don't, I, mm. I don't, I don't really quite see how this works, but how, yeah. how long can it last before the hardware itself breaks down sufficiently that they can't tell that their neighboring cell is not like them or freaky or, you know, they've yeah. got to be able to detect yeah. it. They've got to have some awareness of yeah. what's next to yeah. them and yeah. be able to do that. And, and presumably if your, your uh, genome is completely riddled, you must lose your ability to do that at some point. So so here's what I'll say. Uh, I mean, the thing we know for sure is that they've been around for uh, yeah. 300 million years, 400 million yes. years and going strong. Uh, no sign of uh, no sign of any breakdown, but but the other thing, and this is this is totally unpublished, so 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 treat this with every possible a, a grain of salt. But I'll just uh, sort of uh, tell you, um, we had a project a few years ago where we cultured planaria in mutagens. Mm -hmm. So the stuff that you would dip a zebrafish embryo in for a short period of time to make mutants, we cultured them in that stuff for like a year, and right. what we saw was that. The the particular animals that were in the mutagen would have some some freaky sort of defects, but then you cut them into pieces, and after that, you just get lines of absolutely normal planaria. After that, so I don't know. I assume there must be some kind of limit. I think you're right, but I don't think we're anywhere near having reached it. I think, and and we're gonna. This is something that we're actually investigating actively now. Is is just like what's the limit of this? Like how far can we really trash the genome before in in an organism like this before? Um, before there's a problem, boy, I, I don't know. Um, How small the, a piece can you cut for it to regenerate the entire thing? I mean, are you down to just a few cells, more than that? It's more than a few cells. The record yeah. is uh, something like 275, and this was Thomas right. Hunt Morgan in, in early 1900s. And, really? and maybe right. you could, maybe now with antibiotics and so on, we could do better, you know, even more. Single cells don't work. Um, yeah. it's, it's very hard. You can't get a full planarian out of one cell, but, but you know, little tiny chunks work. Um, so you need the, the context of the cells around you to have some kind yeah, of yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
and, and I don't know, you know, I don't know if that's for a boring reason, meaning that the surface area to volume ratio is too large and it loses all the goodies, you know, that that would be maybe like a, a mechanical, you know, reason, or if it's a deep reason, like the information on building a planarian is, is, is a holographic kind of storage. And if you don't have enough, it's just too fuzzy. If you, you, you can't recover yes. what you need, right. I, I don't know, yeah. you know, yeah. which, which it is. But but there is there is a, a, a an interesting story that relates to what you were just talking about, which which suggests that these kind of electrical transfers can override genetic. I, I I'm just now thinking about this. Can override uh, genetic uh, uh, disrelatedness and 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 um, uh, potentiate cooperativity. And the story, oh, yeah, yeah, and 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 the story goes like this: in 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 tadpoles we can inject a human KRAS mutation, which is a nasty mm -hmm. oncogenic mutation. You inject it, those cells, they, they, they become a tumor, they, they, they yes. invade the embryo, it's just you know, bad, bad seed. What you can do is simultaneously co-inject an ion channel that forces the cells to a voltage at which they will stay electrically connected to their neighbors. And if you do that, even though the genetics has been basically there's a there's a very mm. very powerful uh, hardware level mutation the the oncogene is blazing it doesn't get destroyed yeah. or anything we can see it we can see the protein is still there but the cells don't make a tumor they cooperate they continue to cooperate and they build <laughs> nice skin and muscle and, yeah. and whatever yeah. and this just you know it it dovetails with the with the story that that uh, that we have about uh gap junctions uh potentiating individuals into collectives where where it wipes it tends to wipe that individuality on an informational level you know if we're if if you and i are connected with a gap junctional signal and your memories and my memories molecules are sort of floating back and forth we have no idea whose whose memory belongs to whom right and we become you and i become mm. a we in the sense that we now have one shared pool of me metabolics memories everything it's very hard to 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 keep identity and so I think what you described in the bacteria is really interesting. And, and the metazone version of that is gap junctions, where you use that electrical network yeah. to overcome differences in genetics and, and, and kind of potentiate the cooperativity. Um, I, I'm mm -hmm. amazed that this hasn't caught on more. Um, mm. I, I mean, maybe you're in, in different circles to me, but the, when I talk to cancer people, not very many of them are thinking in these terms, even though it's been known yeah. for a long time that if you transfer the nucleus of a cancer cell into a non cancer cell, yeah. then it, you know, it doesn't become, it doesn't become cancerous. It doesn't become carcinogenic. It's not the nucleus, it's the cytoplasm, which is, which yeah. is, yeah. which is doing yeah. the thing. And, and, and so many yeah. mutations that you see oncogenic mutations in a tumor, you see the same mutations, you know, next to the tumor and uh, uh, elsewhere in the body. Yeah. So it's, it's very much the context they're setting yeah. up. I, I was talking to, um, there's a, a a woman at King's College in London who I met recently, Jodie Rosenblatt, and and, and mm. um, she she was working on epithelium, uh, and 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 this interesting question that you have cells which are which are um, producing uh, dividing and producing new cells, and those new cells are growing towards each other, and they get to a place where they're effectively pr pressing up <clears> against <throat> each other, and there are various mm. mechanoreceptors, and some of them pop out. But which ones pop out, and on what basis do they pop out? Mm. And and the way that she described all of this, um, I, I said you should, you should look at the chart on these cells. And I mentioned your work to her, and um, and and she's she's um, she's been checking, and 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 it all works on charge. Um, there, there's mm. uh, I forget which way around it is, but I'm pretty sure they if they lose the membrane potential, they 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 pop out. Mm -hmm. So it's. Mm -hmm. It seems yeah. r ripe to explain a lot of things which are it's probably not only that, as you said earlier yeah. on, the me mechanoreception and your proximity sure. to sure. other cells. Sure. There's going to be other things going on sure. as well, but sure. it's this balance. It must be a very fine balance. Yeah. That's allowing yeah, you it, to know <laughs> you're the odd one out, off you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's a different, it's a different perspective on this whole problem because traditionally you would have like a like um for example game theory approaches where you would say well the cancer cells are more selfish and that mm. way they do this or that i actually don't think they're any more selfish at all i think what it is is their selves are smaller so what happens is if you have if you're in good gap junctional electrical connection mm -hmm. you are plugged into a network that with yourself meaning the border between you and the outside world in terms of the goals that you're going to maintain the internal milieu all of these things is huge you know you might be a whole hand or you might be a liver or a kidney you know it makes it makes this large thing 
these oncogenes, one of the things they do is they cause um, gap junctional closure. They cause depolarization and gap junctional closure. And as soon as you're a cell that uh, basically partially or, or completely disconnects from that network, now your the border of your self is tiny. That's it. It's just it's just this now. And at that, it's just the size of a single cell. And at that point, you roll back to the kinds of goals that single cell creatures can pursue, which is proliferation and 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 migration to where life is good. And so now, to you, the rest of the animal is just external environment, right? The, the rest of the body is just outside world for you mm -hmm. because you're an amoeba. You're an amoeba now. And so and so that boundary between self and world. One of the things that these electrical connections do is they inflate it, right? During during evolution of multicellularity, that that boundary gets inflated. So that now we are a liver. It's not I'm a liver cell. We are a liver. Whereas, and and it acts collectively to solve large scale problems in in, in morphogenetic spaces. Mm -hmm. As soon as you disconnect from that, you're back to amoeba style, where everything around you is just potentially uh, potentially a threat, potentially um, genetically unrelated to you. All all these things. And then and then of course you do whatever you you know you can, which is metastasize basically. Mm. There was some work some years ago now from a guy called Neil Blackstone in Illinois, um, and he had been working on um, colonial, I forget what, but uh, basically colonies, uh, and, and, and and a lot there, they're, they're, they're forming a, effectively a multicellular organism, is a colony rather than strictly multicellular, but the, the gap mm -hmm. is quite close. But they the conditions that they're subject to depends on where you are in the colony. Are you at the edge, in which case you've got a higher mm. oxygen concentration mm. surrounding mm. you? Or are you in the middle, in which case you're, 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 you're in hypoxic conditions? Um, where do you put your flagella? The, the <laughs> cells that differentiate into flagella and the whole colony can paddle itself around then, well, they're the ones on the outside that have got plenty of oxygen. Which ones become the stem cells and the mm. The, the 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 gametes for the next generation well they're the ones that are in the middle which are effectively oxygen deprived and so just the structure of a blob mm, <laughs> immediately mm, gives you mm. a difference between the outside yeah. and the inside and the likelihood of cells and i i remember reading that and, and the whole thing worked on redox signaling uh, and of course i like the idea of redox chemistry and i looked into is there something about you know mammalian development that that works on redox signaling and and i didn't really find anything very much that that led through and and, and then i yeah. i thought later on well this is a kind of a, a very hard wiring, but you you know every organ will be subject to the same thing. You need yeah, to override yeah, that. Yeah. You need to have a better system of of, of organizing it if you wish to become yeah. any more complicated than a blob. Um, and, and that's where I, I think um, the the bioelectric fields are beginning to come mm. in. Is you've got a level of organization that says we're the same, we're together, we're not quite an individual. We're mm, uh, mm, we're, mm. we're in this grouping here. Uh, but coming back to planaria. You cut it into a you know a lump of 250, 270 cells, whatever it may be. Um, I'm wondering about how how do you prevent your genome becoming completely trashed? Uh, and I suppose part of the answer would be well, if you're not every cell is going to get equally trashed, and not every bit of tissue is going to get equally trashed. So if you were just slice it up into little bits, some bits would be would have a better genome than others. They would have some level of genomic integrity, at least at a functional level, not necessarily in terms yeah. of they've all got neat chromosomes, but they're they're capable of generating the hardware which is required to regenerate the whole planarium. So there's a kind of a bottleneck just in the pieces. And those pieces have to be large enough that they're able to re-establish the the bioelectric fields and know their own morphology. It has to be big enough that it can re-establish a planarium. Mm -hmm. If it's one cell, it's got no idea what its neighbor is. Yeah. So it, it, it couldn't yeah. do it. Yeah. But that I think from a point of view of kind of more conventional genetics, you'd say there was some kind of bottleneck in cutting the planarium up and the smaller bits that were least yeah. damaged would be the ones most likely to regenerate. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, the, well, the thing is they all regenerate. So all every, of them do. Right. Every okay. piece, every, <laughs> there goes that every, argument. <laughs> every, uh, I mean, it's it's uh, right. I think I think that's you you would want to say something like that, but 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 A, every piece regenerates and B, Every mutation that doesn't kill the cell uh, that it's in gets propagated, right? So there are these stem cells. There's about 30% of the animal is these neoblasts. So mm -hmm. when they get hit with a mutation, anything that doesn't kill that stem cell, it now propagates when the thing divides itself in half. It becomes, uh, you know, sort of amplified in the next generation, which is why they look like hell. The genetics look like hell. Um, 
and so uh you know you you would think you would think that that there's a limit to this but i think the pressure of having a nice clean genome is way low for these guys you know mm-hmm. just they've gotten to the point somebody um uh, steve frank gave me a cool uh, analogy to this did you know i didn't know about this when i heard about this that you know um raid arrays in computers right where you have a instead of one disk you have like six disks and there's a system right. which which does a parity thing so that so so apparently ever since raid arrays became a thing the quality of the media has gone down because there's uh-huh. no because the pressure on having a good disk is down because eh, it doesn't matter that much you've got a raid array and so and so right so so there's this feedback loop where the better your software for correcting errors the less pressure there is on the media to be to be reliable but once you go there mm. it's hard to right it's a it's a ratchet because once you get yeah, there you can't yeah. suddenly say well i'm taking my raid array off well now you can't because you because your media is crap now so yeah i mean i i, I some of the stuff i do is on is on mitochondrial dna which is mm. generally said to be at least evolving about 10 times faster than than nuclear mm. genes there's not that much of it it's it's quite small and it always comes in effect in colonies so that there may be several hundred thousand copies in a single mm. thoacyte mm. um and so how does quality control work and in the mm. case of the mitochondria mm. there definitely is quality control even though it's evolving and mutating pretty quickly and again, you have a lot of differences in mitochondrial sequences between different tissues and mutations accumulating as we age and so on, mm. though probably not fast enough to drive aging as a process. Um, mm. and, and again, there's a lot that can be done with um, some form of bottlenecking in the broadest sense, which is to say you mm. need, mm. I mean, the way the way that it seems to work with the mitochondria and the germline is that um, there are groups of cells, clumps of cells, uh, germline cysts. They're called in the female in the female germline, and they group together and they form cytoplasmic connections between them. And they transfer mitochondria as well as Golgi apparatus and RNAs and things into the. It's not necessarily the central cell, but a cell in the middle of this network, um, and and that effectively accumulates mitochondria in what's called the mitochondrial cloud. Sometimes, uh, the Balbiani body. Uh, and 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 there's an interesting question then. You're, you're bringing all this DNA together from separate sources. It, it, what's going on? We've just gone through a rounds of segregation during early germline development, where you produce something like six or seven million uh, ugonia, the, the, the very earliest germ cells, which are dividing by mitosis. And then and then uh, we start fusing them together and transferring material between them. Uh, and, and we did a, a, a simulation study trying to work out, well, what would be the expected rate of mutation accumulation and can we compare it with mutations, mitochondrial mutations in human populations? What is the known incidence of mitochondrial diseases and can we predict that? Mm-hmm. And it turned mm-hmm. out that if you had some level of selection on mitochondrial function, which is to say, the simplest way to see it will be membrane potential. If you can generate, a, if you can, as a single mitochondrion with a bit of mitochondrial DNA, if you can generate a membrane potential, you can go over there. If you can't do it, you stay here. So it's it's, it's at the level of the of the software that's where the judgment is going on. But you're throwing out the hardware, which is not very good, which is not very good in the sense of not able to generate. <laughs> The membrane potential, and then you accumulate all the ones which are capable of generating a decent membrane potential in the in in in, in the uh, what's now the primordial oocyte, and, and then amplify that up, and it become it becomes if it matures, it becomes the oocyte, and, and that selection on the function as they're pooled together was able to predict moderately accurately the actual incidence of mitochondrial diseases. So it's not that you're avoiding mutations so much as you're able to kind of, despite the fact you've always got large populations, you're able to kind of select on some level of function. I've got no idea if there's anything like that happening in planaria, that there's some level that these cells are capable of generating enough of a field that's got the right uh, tuning to to regenerate i mean you're saying everything can but presumably there must be some point where it collapses yeah yeah well uh i mean so so that's so that's super interesting uh, well, one of the things we're going to be looking for when we when we repri- reprise this um uh uh this uh experiment of keeping them in mutagens and all that the one the pr- prediction that i would make uh, um consistent with what you just said is that 
the one thing you can't do is trash uh, all of your ion channels because yes. right and and we, and we know that they're sensitive to that because we can make two-headed worms and and sure. uh, you know yeah. worms that look like all kinds of crazy stuff that's very easy by targeting these gap junctions so so one interesting hypothesis that comes out of what you just said is that the, there is a selection step which is make whatever mutations you want but if you lose the ability to be electrically uh, and I'm not sure if it's just keeping a certain VMEM or maybe reacting. Maybe it's a second order thing. I don't know. We'll see. Um, as long as you hold on to that, everything else is is good to go, right? So, so that's a really interesting idea. I, I, I love I love that idea that there is a minimal electrical competency that you can that you get tested for, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that that's your that that's your bottleneck. Um, yeah, I may I may ping you offline later for some references to this to this thing in mitochondria because yeah. I think that's yeah. actually super interesting. Um, yeah, and I think also we can uh, kind of talk about the um, because there has to be some sort of uh, plastic plasticity threshold of the like at the at the genetics level, right? Um, and I mean that begs the question. I mean, first of all, can we understand just by the genome which organism, which species is it, uh, etc.? And um, you know, and and yeah. how much plasticity can we allow in the in the in the hardware yeah i i don't know Pe people say things like uh developmental constraints you can only make certain things with a certain genome i am not sure of that at all i think that um uh in in my head i have this uh, challenge uh that i think uh, what we should be aiming for is this thing i call the anatomical compiler and I think we ought to be able to do is in the future is sit down in front of a computer and draw the plant or animal that you want, whatever it is. I don't care what it is. It's a it's a seven legged frog with a propeller on top. But, you know, anything you like, <laughs> <laughs> right, like anything you want. And if we knew what we were doing, this thing would compile that description down into a set of stimuli that would get a standard set of cells to build whatever. Now, you're not going to you're not going to make things that disobey gravity. You're not going to make things that, uh, you know, have um, a copper armature for a motor like that. No, that was fine. But 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 biologically possible shapes, whatever they are, you should be able to make. And I bet uh, I don't I don't I don't know if we'll we'll live to see this thing, but 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 I would bet that it's possible. And. I, from the plasticity that I see, even before we really understand anything about how collectives of cells make decisions, but 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 I think we already have examples that I think are telling you that this standard thing we see in development is just one of a huge space of possible things it can do. So so if I had to put money uh, down right now, I would say that uh, I think I think almost any allowable you know geometric shape could be made if we if we understood how to communicate with with cellular collectives um we, what you do know, you think just, it is sorry go ahead uh, what, what do you think it is that's tending to produce the same shape repeatedly i think what i so 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 here's uh my uh, my my hypothesis on all of this i think that uh evolution does not a counter to expectation, I think evolution generally does not take the past literally. In other words, it does not overtrain on prior examples. You know, in, in machine learning, you have this notion of overtraining when when the thing memorizes the past examples instead of generalizing from them, right? And and there may be organisms like that, maybe C. elegans is like that. I don't know, but, mm -hmm. but generally, I think what evolution does is instead of uh, producing a specific solution to a specific environment, I think it generally makes problem solving machines. And the reason I think it does that is because the environment, both the individual cell environment and the overall environment, is so uncertain that maybe we had creatures, you know, way at the beginning that really were just suitable for one kind of environment. I think those are all gone now. I think anything that we see now are our systems. What evolution gives us is a system that can uh, that can behave adaptively in a in a huge range of of circumstances. Not because we've seen those circumstances before, and now you've got built-in uh, abilities to handle them. Although in some cases they may, but what we're making is hardware that's that's a problem solver in a wide domain, and we have a bunch of examples of of that where we challenge living things with conditions that they've never seen before, and they're fine. They do they do they do novel things that that are completely unexpected, and so so I think what evolution does is produce hardware that under normal circumstances reliably does one thing, mm -hmm. but that's not the only thing it can do. 
it's sort of like I, I always envision, you know, you get this, um, you get this calculator, uh, and and you you buy a thousand of them from from a factory, and you turn them all on, and they all say zero. And you say, wow, this thing is incredibly reliable. Yeah, under under those conditions, they'll all say zero. But that's not the only thing it can do. And with appropriate inputs and appropriate other uh, scenarios, it'll do all kinds of stuff. And you'll never know if if all you're watching is the standard. That's why that's why I like synthetic morphology, and I like um, challenging things with uh, with all kinds of weird, with you know, with all kinds of weird scenarios. Um, I give, give you a couple of examples. Uh, here's, here's an example: you take planarium, and you put them in a solution of barium. Mm-hmm. Barium is a non-specific potassium channel blocker, so so all their potassium channels stop working. Yep. Their heads are full of neurons and other things that like to transfer potassium, so their heads explode literally overnight. <laughs> their heads explode. Well, you take those remaining uh, bodies and you leave them in the barium. In fact, you refresh the barium every couple of days. Within two weeks, they regrow a new head. The new head doesn't care about barium at all. No problem. So we mm. said, well, that's that, that's bizarre. <laughs> How could that be? So so we took the we took the original heads. We took the barium adapted heads. We did a really knowing that the answer might not be transcriptional, but but this is the tool we you know the hammer we have. So so basically, what we did was we just asked what what's different in the gene expression between the barium adapted heads and the control heads. A uh, very small number of genes different, and so so imagine now and and so now here's the trick: Planaria never see barium in the wild. There's no barium mm-hmm. out in the wild. There's no there's no evolutionary pressure to know what to do when you're poisoned by barium. That doesn't that doesn't exist. Imagine. Mm-hmm. You 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 you're in this uh, you're in this um, like like a nuclear reactor control room. Right? The genes are all the knobs. You got you know twenty thousand mm-hmm. different knobs. You're hit with this physiological stressor. The thing's melting down. It's going to explode. You don't have time to randomly try different knobs. You don't have time for gradient descent. These are not like bacteria that cells don't turn over all that fast. So you can't just like randomly mutate and see who survives, and then they rebuild mm-hmm. ahead. There's no time for that. The cells don't grow that fast. Within within a very short period of time, this thing navigates the whatever twenty thousand dimensional space of gene expression to, to to zero in on about a dozen transcripts that will solve your physiological problem. Now, how in the heck does it know which it, for for a completely new stressor like this? How does it know which ones those are? So, so you can think about it. So, so we don't know the answer to this, but one thing that it might be able to do is okay. I, I've never seen barium before. But I have seen epileptic seizures before. And so maybe the excitotoxicity of having your neurons die from, from abnormal potassium flux mm-hmm. is somewhat similar. So, so what you really have is you have the ability to generalize. So this is a system that, that you know, in any other, if we had a robot that did this, this would be generalization and learning of the highest degree, right? This is like, I've, I, I haven't seen this before, but I've seen something else. And I bet it's similar enough to this that I can try, I can, I can try this out, right? So that's so that's one example. Um, another example is the xenobots. So so we take some yeah. skin, right, from frog embryos. They they replicate themselves with kinematic self-replication. They run around, collect other skin cells, put them into a little ball, and now you get your next gen. There's, there's never been any xenobots in the wild. There's never been pressure to be a good xenobot. There's never, no other animal does kinematic self-replication. So I think life is capable of huge number of, of, of a variety yeah. of things that solve problems that go beyond you know the narrow default that we see i mean just coming back to the the, the barium issue and the, the generalization uh, i mean there's lots of there, there was a, a bacterium dinococcus radiodurans uh, which mm. is mm. astonishingly radiation resistant and grows on the inside of nuclear power stations and can survive in outer space and all kinds of things like that they sometimes call it i think colon the bacterium and um and, and the question is well how, how does it actually do that and and it's largely exposure to other types of stress so for example dehydration stress generates mm-hmm. pretty much mm-hmm. the same kind of internal metabolic problems that radiation does um and so it's in a, in some sense i would see it as 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 your metabolism is stressed in a particular way it doesn't matter if it's barium or something else which is stressing it as an epileptic fit which is stressing it in that way excited toxicity or or whatever there's a particular type of stress that the cell is experiencing in its metabolism and there's a physiological response to deal with that which might be to express a different um a, 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 a different iron pump on the membrane which doesn't do potassium but does sodium instead or i don't know what 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 do i do but there'll be a physiological response that yeah, you could have yeah, to yeah. that which is is um 
is in effect generalizing from the stress to the metabolism internally rather than being able to identify what the external problem yep. is. Yep, yep, yep. I, I completely agree with that, right? So so that's one uh, strategy, that's one policy for handling the unknown. And I think that's exactly right. I think I think that that um multi-scale architecture where where you have uh, you have you have the, the 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 genetics and you have the physiology and then you have anatomy and so on it 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 becomes like a a neural network not in the neural aspect but it, but in the information processing aspect it generalizes for the same reason that that uh, uh, that the connectionist networks generalize in, in in machine learning it's that it's it's a it's um it's an inherent property of these networks that they can they can do stuff like that right every layer sort of generalizes to the categories of the layer before it and so that's that's so that's why i think i think it's just an inherent structure and not to not to also forget that that now we see that even pathways can learn right so they have is some ability to learn from experience and so on so mm -hmm. um i think that's that's why that's why i'm so sanguine on on being able to build anything from cells and where are or or how these memories are uh stored Uh, I mean, Mike can probably answer that, but just one story to insert uh, before before he does. Um, one interesting there was a, there was, a, there was a lady she died uh, recently at the age of ninety six uh, at, at, at UCL uh, called Ursula Mitvok, and she worked on sex determination for a long time, and she was very oh, interested. Oh, she died. In, yes, oh, are you familiar with Ursula as well? I know her. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know she passed. I knew she was. She was quite quite old. Yeah. Yeah, oh, she was extraordinarily active until really mm. only a couple of years ago. Mm. Um, I, I wrote an obituary of her. I really admired her work. Oh. I'll send it to you. Yeah, but, please. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But she um, she linked it to growth rates um, because there's all these different types of chromosomal sex determination, and you know X and mm. Y chromosomes are only a part of it. There've been multiple origins of different types of X and Y chromosome birds and. Um, many other things have got, you know, ZW chromosomes, where it's the other way around that the the male is the homogametic sex with two of the two of the same chromosomes, um, and then there's temperature dependent sex determination, and she had linked the whole lot to growth rates, uh, and effectively what the Y chromosome is doing is activating some growth factors that say, you know, you go ahead and grow quickly, um, and. There's some interesting questions in my own mind about mitochondrial inheritance and when when you are allowed to grow quickly and when it's best not to grow quickly, which may so so this this earliest distinction between uh, a, a male um, embryo developing and a female uh, is just size. Um, males grow faster early on, not necessarily throughout. The entire development, but but uh, but but grow faster earlier, mm -hmm. and then she called attention to um, true hermaphrodites, who uh, I think there's maybe a different term now, but effectively have a, an ovary on one side and a testis on the other side, and it's not random which side it's on. The testis is usually you know seventy percent of the time is on the right hand side, and the ovary on the left hand side. Um, and there are slight differences in growth rates between the right hand side and the left hand side at, at, at that early stage. Measurable differences, measurable, you know, with a with 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 a weighing scales or a ruler, practically that that level of uh, of detection. Mm. And so, you know, talking about developmental plasticity, what are you going to develop, an ovary or a testis? Uh, it's, it's a pretty constrained developmental plasticity in relation to some of the things you're talking about, but still, it's determined not just genetically. Yeah. Uh, and there are all kinds of interesting, you know, there are mice with mutations in particular genes that will lead to a sex change, which have got nothing to do with the Y chromosome or with uh, the, the mm -hmm. SRY gene or anything like that. It's able to overwrite the SRY gene simply by increasing the growth rate of the embryo. Um, or, or decreasing it and becoming female instead of male. So there are these other, in, in terms of what do you develop into and how much developmental plasticity is there, factors like growth rates um, can play a major role. Uh, exactly how and how common that is, I don't know. But uh, you know, this whole idea that temperature dependent sex determination in amphibians and so on basically doing the same thing as 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 a, as as the chromosome shows all this 
possibility of over, overwriting things we think we know the answer to. We think the answer lies in a gene which says you're going to become yeah. male, you're going to become female. Yeah. And there's all of these you know, in, in, intersexual states, in fact, and, and, and mostly it's this or that, but there's a scope in the middle. It's what she called, I think, uh, um, I forget the term that she had for it, but it's, it's, it's basically a, a, a threshold dichotomy, I think was the phrase that she used. So mm -hmm. the genes tend to push you into one state or the other state, but there's quite a lot of flex between the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing. Uh, yeah, so 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 I I, I can talk a little bit about the the bioelectric memories that override the genetics but but I want to mm. go um, first to even even just more basic than that so so here's the here's the kind of to me the most stunning thing imagine a single uh, amniote embryo let's say an amniote embryo so a bird or human or something yeah. and it's a it's a flat blasted disc like this about 50,000 cells so you look at, at an early stage so you look at this thing and you say well there's an embryo and you might ask yourself well, what are we counting when we say there's one embryo I mean most of the time there's one embryo, but one thing you can do is you can, and, and I, I did this as a grad student in, in ducks and chicken eggs, you can take a little needle and you can put a scratch or, or multiple scratches through that blastoderm. And this is a method discovered by this guy Lutz in the forties. So you, you put a couple of scratches in, and then what happens is that each region of that blastoderm for a while until it heals up, uh, doesn't feel the other regions and self-organizes into an embryo. And then mm -hmm. when it heals up, you got conjoined twins or triplets or or whatever. Right? Mm -hmm. So so now so 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 there's a couple of interesting things that come out of this. First of all, what you're counting when you say it's an embryo is how many distinct locally aligned collectives are there that are all working on one project. And usually there's one, and that project is getting to a particular area of morphous space, building the right kind mm -hmm. of embryo. Mm -hmm. But there doesn't have to be one. There could be anywhere from zero to probably ten or so, I would guess. And that number is absolutely not genetically determined. You don't know how many embryos are in this thing until the physiology has had its say. And then you will find out. Maybe it's it's typically one, but it doesn't have to be one. How many are in there is a funny kind of thing because it, hmm. it will self-organize, right? It doesn't, you don't know that there's one. And and what I like about this is that aside from the fact that it's just like this thing that's totally not determined, again, what nature, what 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 evolution has given us is a machine that generates coordinated selves. It doesn't give us one coordinated self. It gives us a machine that can generate these coordinated selves. And if you leave it alone, it'll give you one. If you cut it in half, it'll give you two. And you can sort mm -hmm. of, you know, you can you can have your pick. It's a little bit, I think, linked to the same question in cognitive science. If I show you a brain and you don't know what a human is, and I say to you, hey, look at this thing. How many, how, how do you, how many intelligences are you supposed to fit in there? Uh, you, you have no clue. We don't, we don't have any way of estimating, you know, the number of intelligences per square, you know, per cubic mm -hmm. inch of, of material. Like we, we don't know. But 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 typically with typical humans, you say, well, that's one. That's you know, my friend, my friend Joe. But actually, we know from split brain patients, from dissociative disorders, that there's all kinds of potential individuals in there, right? And then you know, mm -hmm. you sort of think there's one. But so so again, that. Uh, and again, not genetically determined. It's all about inputs and history and uh, and and learning and and you know experiences and who knows what else. So so this the, there, there's some very basic and fundamental stuff that isn't genetic because the genetics doesn't lay down the final answer. It generates it it gives you a machine that will then generate these things in various you know in various orders. And in planaria, so what we've done in in planaria is just this. Um, if you look down in uh, onto a planarian using this voltage sensitive dye you see a pattern the voltage pattern we've sort of learned to decode it we can tell when mm -hmm. it says build one head versus two the basic question was hey how do you know uh how many heads you should have as a planarian yes how, how yeah. would you know right the assumption is well what else would it be it's a you know it's a genetically determined it's one what else would it be well uh so so what happens so so what happens is there's a um uh there's a uh, there's a single uh, there's a there's an electrical gradient that normally specifies one head one tail. Well, we use some ion channel drugs and we we changed that to say two heads, and no genetic changes. So just a brief uh, what forty eight hour physiological stimulus, mm -hmm. and then uh, that that animal will then if you injure it will then make two headed animals. Now a couple of interesting things that two headed pattern is read out from a one-headed 
post. In other words, it's mm. not a pattern of what you have now. It doesn't reflect your current anatomy. It's a it's a counterfactual uh, a pet memory. It's a representation of what you will do if you get injured in the future. So it's like a it's like an early version of of this kind of mental time travel that brains are very good at, right? Imagining things that aren't true right now. Uh, no, no genetic changes. And the amazing thing is that if you take these two-headed animals and you cut them further, they will continue to generate two-headed worms forever, even though there's nothing genetically wrong with any of them. So mm. the question of, of right, the question of what determines the number of heads in a planarian is kind of subtle. On the one hand, you can sort of say it's DNA because if you didn't have the ion channels, none of this would be happening. So okay, sure. we need the hardware, we know that. Um, but also, it is the case that the exact same hardware is perfectly happy making one head, two heads, heads from a different species, weird um, uh, spiky mm. uh, uh, cylinders that we've made that don't look anything like planaria. That same hardware is perfectly happy making all of that stuff. And where and and the information is in the um, uh, in at, at least part of that. Inf- the important part of that information is in this in the steady state bioelectrical gradient that is basically the software to the genetically specified hardware. Um, yeah, and then you can see it. You can see it. You can rewrite it, and uh, and 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 it totally dominates the default. Uh, you know, the default state. Have you managed to do the same kind of thing in, say, tadpoles or is there other animals than planaria? Yeah, yeah. So in tadpoles, so so this is what we've done. We've made tadpole um, faces that look like other species of frogs. We've uh-huh. made tadpole tails that look like zebrafish, and mm-hmm. we've made uh, frogs regenerate legs the way uh, salamanders regenerate legs. And uh, and we're currently and trying this is it in mice. All from from the ion channels, from modulating the expression of ion channels. Ion channels or neurotransmitters, which are often the downstream. You know the the basically much like in the nervous system, the vo- the way that the electric circuit propagates its uh, decisions down is through movement of neurotransmitters, which then turn genes on and off, which then do other stuff. Yeah. So so sometimes you can skip it. You can skip the, the 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 top layer and 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 do the and do the neurotransmitter thing. So we've done it that way too. But yeah, that's uh-huh. basically that's basically it. So we've done it. We've done it. And 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 we know this works in mammals because uh, human channelopathies. So you've got human humans who who have either taken drugs that affect ion channels. So there's a bunch of ion channel drugs or teratogens. They will have the same craniofacial defects as we see, for example, in 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 frog. Same. same Wait, how 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 much of uh, of evolution is actually geared to restricting um, the scope for phenotypic plasticity? Do you think? I mean, it, it seems as if less in the case of planaria, more in the case of mammals. Let's say, still the scope is there, um, but uh, I suppose if what you want to do is generally produce an organism that looks the same as its parents, then there must be really strong selection pressure on the the order in which, especially ion channels, are being expressed. I mean, that's true. There certainly are stereotypical patterns of expression. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if the pressure is to produce the same thing that your parents were, or if it's to produce something that's successful. And you know, like I, I don't know. I mean, the I, fact I, that I, most I, animals do look like their parents implies that there's been selection pressure to produce the same thing, despite the, the huge potential scope for doing something completely different. They they look like them uh, under the same conditions. So so people yeah. I think people who work in plants will tell you that uh, depending on depending on the the, the where you where you plant that seed, you're going to get things that don't look anything like the like, like like the parrots, right? And I think I think in animals it's you know sort of less that, but um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if the pressure is for consistency or if the pressure is for some other kind of second order parameter like. If if the environment is what we've seen before, don't do anything different. Just do the exact <laughs> same thing. But but yeah. if circumstance does change, you've got all these other tools that you can deploy. We we will have. Um, I'm I'm I, I don't I don't uh, I don't like to talk about stuff that isn't published and peer reviewed because then it's just you know me telling stories. But I think in the next six months or so, you're you're going to see a couple of we're going to have a couple of papers come out that address this this issue that look at. Um, 
uh, gene expression in xenobots compared to normal embryos and xenobots made from other cells that are not frog and have nothing to do with frog embryos. Uh, I, I think the plasticity is, is enormous. I don't think we've been able to, mm -hmm. we've even scratched the surface of, of, of all this. I mean, when we are thinking of plasticity, I always um, also admire this idea of uh, ploidy, for example. So you mentioned mm. that uh, planaria are mix up, mix of ploids. Uh, then there are, I mean, we can talk about um, plants itself. We know that they change their ploidy. So how much that has to do, or do you think that this can be also a factor? Um, I don't know much about it, but 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 I will tell you my favorite uh, ploidy story that I think bears on this. Mm -hmm. So salamanders, uh, you can there's a there's a little uh, tube, a little tube that goes to the kidneys, the kidney tubule. If you take a cross section through this kidney tubule, what you see is tip, typically eight or ten cells working together to make this nice kidney tubule. Okay. Um, if you can, if now one thing you can do is you can make uh, uh, these, you can make these newts that are multiple ploidy. So you can make four n, six n, eight n newts, right? Mm -hmm. So the first amazing thing is that eh, you can you can double or triple the amount of genetic material. They don't care. Fine, you still get the same newt. So so that's kind of, that you know all of that that speaks to my same point is that it doesn't really assume. So so embryogenesis does not assume how many copies of a, of, of your genetic material you have. So that's the first thing. The second thing is as you increase the ploidy the cells get physically bigger and bigger, okay? Yes. When the cells get bigger and bigger, the salamander stays exactly the same. How can it be? Because fewer and fewer of the larger cells are being used to make the various organs. So you can't count on how many copies of, of the genes you have. You can't count on uh, what, uh, how many, uh, what, what your cell size is. Um, if, you're a, if you're even a human embryo, we can cut you into four pieces and you get four quadruplets. You can't even count on how many cells you have. Now the ploidy story is so, so you really you really just assume you have to as a proper embryo you have to assume you don't know much going in like, who knows what things are going to be like and you still have to be able to do the right thing. Now, now here's the ploidy the rest of the ploidy story. So when you make eight n newts, the cells get so enormous that there's not room for more than one cell to make a tubule. What do they do? A single cell bends around itself like this, <laughs> leaving a hole in the middle, which which gives you the tubule. Now that okay, so so the thing the thing that's crazy about that is that now that's a completely different molecular mechanism. Instead of cell to cell communication, which you need to make the tubule, mm -hmm. you are now using cytoskeletal bending to 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 drag yourself into this crazy shape. That's so crazy. what I love, right? It's amazing. And so so what I love about this is that it's a good example of top down causation, meaning that. And then like, it, it, what you've got is, is it, it, in the service of this anatomical feature, different molecular mechanisms get called up. And we're seeing something like this in, in some of our um, not yet published stuff in, in, in the Xenobots too. Different molecular uh, mechanisms get called up to do their thing to achieve this, this sort of higher level uh, outcome. So, um, you know, that, so so I think yeah, I think ploidy is 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 a, is a fantastic mm. example of this because if you can't if you can't if you don't assume how many copies of your instructions you're going to have, you don't assume how big your cells are, you don't assume how many of them you have, you better have rock solid morphogenetic control to get the job done despite all of that. And yeah. and salamanders do, which is why they're so regenerative. But they're not they're not as good as planaria, but they're pretty darn good. They regenerate all kinds of organs. So, I mean, under, underpinning all of that, this uh, cell volume uh, uh, and, and and ploidy, it's not mm. just ploidy; it's it's genome size, it's the total mm. amount of DNA in the nucleus. Mm. So it's the nuclear mm. volume. There is a very tight correlation between nuclear volume and and cell volume, um, which used to be known as the C value paradox, which is to say, mm. the mm. cells, you know, mostly amoeba, have a, some enormous genomes. Um, you know, thousands of times larger than the human genome. Um, why it's you know this this whole idea of junk DNA? What are they putting in there? Um, a, a large amount of it is that you have a large cell, you have a large nucleus, and you fill that nucleus with DNA. And ploidy forces you to have a larger higher ploidy forces you to have a larger nucleus, which forces you to have a larger cell, and that forces you to be resourceful in terms of you want to make a tubule, <laughs> you do it from a single cell instead of mm. fourteen cells or what it used to be. So there's, and I, I don't think there's ever been a good explanation for why a, a large cell would have a large nucleus. There, there are ideas out there, um, but 
they often relate to the ratio between the number of ribosomes and the number of nuclear pore complexes and this kind of thing. None of them are particularly persuasive. I don't think we have a good explanation for why a large cell should have a large nucleus. Um, and yet it's able to force all of these changes on you. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, so um, since we are running out of time, I mean, may, maybe I can throw in like one last topic and uh, probably I, I believe that probably both of you would uh, uh, kind of like to discuss about it. So, uh, so when you mention about neurotransmitters, which is like one level down uh, kind of uh, regulation, uh, let's talk about anesthesia, because I think that's mm -hmm. also uh, something which is one level down. Uh, regulates it. I don't know how much of the work is done on some sort of, you know, simpler uh, scales. Um, but, um, okay, I mean, let's... Well, you let's can anesthetize single cells, critters, yeah. planaria, and things like that. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I mean, I discussed in, in the last chapter of the book some of the work from Luca Turin yeah. um, showing, showing that anesthetics affects electron transfer to oxygen. Um, mm. And we've been doing some work on that just recently. We've not published any of it yet. We've not got very far at all, so I won't say much. But we've basically we we also find that it it lowers oxygen uh, rate of consumption of oxygen, um, and and depending on the context in which you give them, affects the membrane potential. Now, to try and distinguish between just the mitochondria making ATP and that ATP being used to control the uh, a plasma membrane iron pump, for example, and ATPase in the membrane. Um, obviously, if you don't have as much ATP, that pump is not going to work as well. And so, you know, this is not a causal link between mitochondrial function and consciousness. All it says is that underpinning this energy consuming process, which is consciousness, energy matters, which is a statement of the obvious, I suppose. But there's also a possibility that there are direct fields involved that you're influencing uh, the the electromagnetic fields generated potentially by mitochondria and that there can be direct interactions with the plasma membrane field that way. That's a much more exciting possibility to my mind, um, but very, very difficult to distinguish between how do you change the field in a measurable way while maintaining ATP synthesis at the same level, uh, which is a tricky thing, a tricky mechanistic thing to do, but we're trying to get at that. I mean, I think this is this is perhaps well one of the one of the biggest questions in science now is what actually is, is going on in the in the wiring <laughs> of consciousness, if you like. And I'm I'm certain fields are involved, mm. uh, but but how exactly? I'm I'm not so sure. Mm. Yeah, so it's really interesting. Uh, you you might enjoy. Um, I've got this uh, this book from this guy uh, J C Bose B O S E, and I can mm -hmm. send you a PDF of it. Uh, he's a, a Indian guy from over a hundred years ago that was doing a bunch of physiology, and he and he started anesthetizing animal tissues and using electrophysiology to monitor what happens, and then he yeah. did the plants right, and then eventually a, a metal bar. So so he's got this he's got this book called Response in the Living and Non Living where um you know maybe so 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 i don't know the mechanisms that underlie any of that but but there could be if it, if it's re, if it's if it's the kind of thing you're talking about i could easily see uh why he would be seeing effects like this in 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 inorganic substrates as well yeah i tend to draw a line at life um which is to say what i was talking about at the beginning about bacteria using the the uh the fields on the membrane as a means mm. of integrating the metabolism of the cell. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I would see then the central nervous system as some kind of an amplification and, and, and yeah, uh, yeah. far more subtle and complex, of course, but, 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 but still somehow linked to the integration of information through, through linking your metabolic state at a cellular mm. level mm. and then mm. at a network level and so on. Yeah. Um, uh, whether you need fields to be involved in that, I don't know, but we can measure changes in the EEG. And I don't think we have an absolutely clear idea of exactly what is generating the EEG at a subcellular level. Is it, is mm -hmm. it just the plasma membrane, the axonal yeah. membranes that are depolarizing or are mitochondria playing a role in that as well? Yeah. So that's an area yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated by, but it's difficult to get at. Mm -hmm. 
yeah so in the like i think uh, if we think of the same uh, about the same topic interesting thing is so uh, about the synthetic cells or synthetic life in general like all the work which is going on there um, i mean um, from the engineering pr- perspective right that's also um, um, kind of kind of um, um let's say crucial in in a way or it is focused on the information centric view right like uh, uh, people are trying to put together again some sort of genomes uh, some sort of genes uh, transcription translation of course they have membrane in but my uh, question or maybe briefly if you can uh, just explain your view so how important would be this kind of bioelectric or kind of this software that we have discussed today for to to create those kind of synthetic systems Maybe. I mean, a one-word answer. All, all important. I have to say, I don't think you're going to do it without. Like, how do you? One hundred. Yeah, one hundred. Like, <laughs> like uh, how, or is it possible to kind of, um, you know, I don't know, uh, do it without the information part, without the, without, without the hard, hardware? Uh, I think you can only go so far without genes at all. Um, how far i don't know i mean they, you know the planaria is a very good example there you can you can scramble your genome but presumably you can't completely collapse your genome when i think about it the other way up uh, with the origin of life um how do where does information come from in biology um and and i'm fairly persuaded now from our own experiments but other people's work around the world as well in the last 5 6 7 years um a lot of a lot of metabolism is spontaneously self-organizing. You start with CO2 and hydrogen and you get Krebs cycle intermediates, you get amino acids, the same ones that we we have in metabolism. You get nucleotides that way as well. Um, we've not done them all yet, but we've done some and other people have done others. And uh, you know, this idea then of a, of a spontaneously self-organizing metabolism that starts with CO2 and hydrogen and gives you all the monomers and eventually polymers. Um, it's by no means is any of this proved, but but five or six years ago it would have been complete hand waving, and now there's some experimental backing for quite a lot of it. Um, and you think, okay, well, it's it, you know it's it, it's going to make trace amounts of things like nucleotides. How can it reliably make more nucleotides and get better at making copies of itself in the absence of genes or any information? And the answer is well, positive positive feedback loops will allow you to kind of feed off the environment and of yourself to get better at making copies of yourself, but you're only ever going to do, you're going to keep repeating the same network under the same conditions. If you change the conditions, you might get a different network. It may or may not function, but under under this set of conditions, you will keep recovering that same network until you introduce genes and information into it. And you can enter into that world, you can introduce random sequences of RNA and they will have directly or indirectly some effect on the rates of cell growth and flux of metabolism. Even just introducing a piece of RNA is actually going to change the metabolic rate because you're now polymerizing nucleotides. So you're pulling nucleotides out of solution and you pull metabolism through faster. So even making a completely random piece of RNA makes you better at doing what you were doing before than if you hadn't done that. So it's, there's this kind of interesting insights into what is information in biology? Where is it coming from? Uh, and 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 it's what it seems to be allowing is effectively plasticity, which is to say you've got this hardwired proto metabolism, which is basically thermodynamics and kinetics, and it's you know you will go on recovering exactly the same thing. What genes allow you to do is just change it a bit <laughs> and allow a different outcome, and that outcome can be reliably inherited. Um, and by the time we're getting into networks of cells, then it's interesting because what I'm taking from what Mike has been saying is that the genes are becoming almost buried again, and it's the network of the cells which are generating higher level properties, which are which are forcing them to behave in a similar way, in a similar setting, and a potentially completely different way in a different setting. So there's this interplay all along between kind of the hard wiring and the plasticity and the information which means different things in different contexts but allows the plasticity really yeah, yeah uh, that's so great. that's fascinating and uh, 
So with that, uh, thank you so much, guys. Uh, thank you for doing this. This was completely fun. I mean, I think was great the, the kind thank of you. ideas Absolutely. that we have explored, it it was amazing. Absolutely. So thank you yeah, so much. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks yeah. for doing yes, this. Yes, thank, thank you. That's, that's been great fun. Yes, thank you. Yeah. All thank right. You, Mike. All right. Uh, Talk you. soon, everybody. See yeah. You. yeah. Bye. Bye now. Bye. Bye.